Hello, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be with you here today, now that I can't see any of you. OK. <laughs> I'll assume you're out there. So I really have what I think is one of the coolest jobs in the universe, which is to actually show you the universe, the universe of research data rendered as photography to really help tell the story of science and astronomy through pictures. Now, my title is Revealing a Hidden Universe. And the question might be, what do you mean by hidden? Right? I'm, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. Well, so much of what astronomers do is actually hidden from us from a variety of ways. For instance, we look at things that are incredibly distant. And so as a result, we, we need really large telescopes to, to show us what's out there, to, to, be able to magnify it. We look at things that are incredibly faint, that you can't just see. Like, I mean, even if you go out in the night sky and look with your naked eye at the Milky Way, you, you can barely see a few hints of it. But if you, say, expose it for 5, 10 minutes, an hour, right, you reveal all sorts of hidden detail that's there. But relevant to what I'm talking about, I think I more want to focus on the idea that this narrow strip of light that we call visible light is only a small fraction of the whole spectrum beyond visible, which increasingly is where astronomers turn their focus to get a more complete view of the universe. So the imagery I'm showing you to, uh, this afternoon is very much hidden because it's actually outside of the realm of human vision. Now, this leads me to a, a point because if I were to show you an accurate view of, say, what the uh, flame nebula looks like in infrared light, you wouldn't be very impressed because your eye doesn't see infrared light. I think you'd much rather see me present something like this, which is the flame nebula rendered in a visible way, showing you the dust clouds and the, the regions of star formation very vividly. So how do I do this? How am I showing you something you can't see? Well, I'm going to have to stop a second and teach you some bad words. These are very bad words. They've been used for a long time. That doesn't excuse them. The words are false color. Now, this is a terminology that was devised back in the 70s for a very good and noble purpose, back when JPL was sending missions to the outer planets and they were returning imagery in an era where pretty much every picture you ever saw was a picture in what we would call natural light. They needed a term to help people understand that sometimes they were be sh being shown a picture that really wasn't what your camera would have photographed or what your eye would have seen when you were out there. Unfortunately, the, the choice of terms, false color, has, has stuck with us a long time to, to sort of dismissively describe pretty much all of astronomy imagery as if there is something dicey going on, like we are somehow deceiving you. Uh, why I would love people, oh wait, that button, big button, yeah. Why I'd love people to get away from that term is kind of embodied in this example. I show you this page here from uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I dare say that, that few, if any of you, can read this, like I, I certainly can't. Um, but if I were to lay up next to it this uh, English translation, right? You know, wh wh what is this? Would we call these false words? No, not at all. They, they are a translation from one language we can't read into another language that we, we can read. And hopefully, you know, accurate, maybe not exactly spot on, but definitely giving us a good representation of what that original illegible text is to us. Well, in that sense, I would really love you to think about what we do with light, not in terms of rendering it in false colors, but rendering it in translated colors. What we do is we take colors in tr that are real, that are truly out there, that represent variations across the spectrum, and render them into colors that you can see in the classic language of red, green, blue that is part of our human vocabulary on light and color. So as photographers, you all know that one core part of any photograph is the story. And fortunately, in the field of astronomy and astrophysics, we have many, many glorious stories to tell in our imagery. Whether it is looking up at regions of star formation through th strewn through the Milky Way, where, where dust clouds condense and form, and, and new generations of stars burst out, then their light sculpts and re-sculpts the material around them. Whether it's following stars through their life cycle, moving out of their natal clouds and off into the universe, sometimes having dramatic effects on surrounding material and lighting up around us. We can look further down to the deaths of stars, the end of their lives, whether they are to die quiescently like our sun will in about five billion years, puffing off their outer layers into a gaseous envelope and recycling a little bit of material back into space, or Larger stars dying a little more dramatically in the form of supernova explosions, which for a very brief period are so bright and violent, they, they actually shine brighter than the rest of the stars in the galaxy and leave behind these, these incredible remnants of material uh, forging all the heavy elements. In fact, everything in this room, almost everything that you are looking at 
is made up of elements that were formed in the hearts of supernova over five billion years ago before we formed. You know, we were truly, as Carl Sagan said, made of star stuff, that everything in our bodies, really more massive than carbon, came out of a supernova billions of years ago. We can look at our galaxy sort of ensemble in total and see it as a collection of regions of star formation, passage on and, 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 and dissolution and, and, and uh, just see it as a global process. Here coating dust as seen by uh, far infrared light so that the, the warmer dust is showing up as blue white and the coldest, coldest, darkest filaments are showing up gl dimly glowing the longest infrared wavelengths in red. We can look at our galaxy as a whole and peer towards its very center. This infrared image of the uh, Milky Way is seen towards the constellation Sagittarius at infrared wavelengths of light actually penetrates through the clouds of dust that completely obscure it in visible light. And we can see straight through to the bright star cluster at the very center that we now know is a swarm of stars around a supermassive black hole, itself the mass of several million suns, all at one point in space that the other stars are orbiting around. We can look out beyond the Milky Way to other galaxies and see these processes that reflect similarities and differences to our own, all driven by the same physics with spiral arms and disks of stars, yet each one as unique as a snowflake, reflecting a unique history and an evolution to this point and sort of pointing the way where they go and where they become, uh, what they will become in the future and giving us hints on what our long-term future will be in our galaxy, whether we quiescently evolve or collide and, and with other galaxies, like someday we will merge with the Andromeda galaxy. So returning to the spectrum, just a, a quick reminder of what we're looking at. This narrow slice that we call visible light is just one tiny piece out of what we have dubbed the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Whether you're talking about gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible infrared microwave or radio, right? All this is, it's the same stuff. It's all light. It's all electric and magnetic fields oscillating and propagating through space at the speed of light. And the only thing that differentiates what we call a gamma ray or what we call an infrared light or what we call a, a blue photon, the only thing that's different across this entire thing is just the spacing between those fields, the thing that we call the wavelength of the light. And so, you know, we, we, it's easy to think like gamma rays are just something weird that make giant green monsters and microwaves are only for cooking food, but really it's just ways that we've compartmentalized something that truly is an undifferentiated spectrum. And as astronomers, we understand that every part of that spectrum gives us a window into a different part of the physical processes that are affecting the, the origins and evolution of the universe. Let me zoom in a little bit and focus more on the, the regions we tend to deal with, uh, and uh, at least that I tend to deal with in, in uh, my work, are uh, the, the parts of the spectrum around visible light, particularly the infrared part of the spectrum. I've been working on the NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope project since actually before it launched over 12 years ago, and it has been the infrared component of NASA's Great Observatory Program, the most famous of which, of course, is the Hubble Space Telescope covering the visible spectrum. And Spitzer has been out there Actually, currently, uh, it is further away from us on the Earth than we are from the Sun. It's drifting its own orbit around the Sun. We kicked it far out behind the Earth so that the giant heat radiator that Earth represents wouldn't affect its observations. It only has to protect itself from the Sun. And it's out there picking up wavelengths of infrared light that you can never see from the ground because the atmosphere will block our view. Of course, there are other infrared telescopes out there. The Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, is another JPL mission that I've been involved with. And it traded off a little bit of image sharpness and sensitivity for the benefit of being able to image the entire sky in the infrared in a mere six months of observation time. Or the Herschel Space Telescope, the European Space Agency's uh, uh, venture into this process that lets us see much longer wavelengths of infrared light, telling us things about the really cold, dusty universe. On the flip side of the spectrum, we have other telescopes out in space, the New Star X-ray Observatory, the first focusing high energy X-ray telescope that's being operated out of Caltech, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the X-ray component of the Great Observatory Program, and the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. That was a ultraviolet uh, satellite program that was mapping most of the sky in ultraviolet light. And you can think of each of these telescopes as a particular combination of your favorite camera and favorite lens, right? Each one has a unique set of capabilities unlike the others, and each one is giving you access to a certain kind of science and a certain kind of understanding. Now, I've, gotten, I've been very fortunate. I get to work across the whole spectrum in the photos that I make, and, and there is, well, there's one missing here. Uh, it starts with an H or something, right? I think I mentioned that before. 
Yeah, Hubble, right. I actually once in a while get to work with that too, but that's mostly my, co uh, my colleagues back on the East Coast, Johns Hopkins. So this is how I go out in the field and take my photos. I don't sit behind duck blinds, I don't climb mountains, I sit at my computer and browse archives that are decidedly photographically hostile. And we find the data sets we want, and I go through a process that's kind of like repeating the imaging process once the data is collected, because we have data that's very high dynamic range, high signal to noise. It's, it's, it's numerically calibrated, right? We're interested in the fluxes. And we have to go in and kind of choose the exposure on the data, right? We have to almost go through a whole new process of re-imaging it. You'd be hard pressed at this full ex extent linear stretch to see what you're looking at. But for instance, if I drag the white point and just drag the brightness down that way, you might start to see sort of the spirally structures of a galaxy, but clearly that's not good because you're clipping all the, the bright features and you're still losing the dark features. So we have to go through a bit of mathematical processing similar to you know, a gamma adjustment on an image, though uh, the formulation we use actually, uh, uh, something that I think works a little better for astronomical images is called the arc sync, inverse hyperbolic cosine function. And it has a nice benefit that as you pass kind of towards zero, it acts very linear in its response, but as you go to large numbers, it becomes very logarithmic. And it actually gives you access to a whole family of adjustments, just like a gamma correction get, does. So you can sort of find what's the right balance in the image to bring out the faint detail before you get too far into the noise, but doesn't burn in the highlights. So you sort of identify what looks good, and then I can export that out as a TIFF file. And from there, I shift my workflow over into Photoshop, like uh, you know, pretty much any other photographer might. And uh, you know, any image processing software will do. But Again, I'm working with data sets that are intrinsically black and white, so I have to go and assign them into the color channels to bring the color out. Drop one grayscale data set into the red channel, drop another one down into the green channel, drop a third one down into the blue channel, and of course, lo and behold, we have a full color image. So that's why I talk about representative or translated color, right? I'm using red, green, and blue as our lexicon, and what I'm going to do now is call up a little visual glossary for you so you can actually follow this process. What I'm doing here is letting the colors of these swatches indicate the color in the image that you're actually looking at, red, green, and blue. And th where they fall on the spectrum is telling you where that color in the image is getting pulled from in terms of observational data. Now this one happens to fall in what we would call natural light. Blue is being mapped to blue, red to red, green to green. But if we were to drag those things down and now Ah, I think I double clicked into the infrared part of the spectrum, we now see a completely different view of this galaxy. The starlight is now only showing up at the shortest wavelengths of light, uh, the shortest infrared wavelengths of light, and so that's all in the blue side. Whereas the dust, which was invisible and only really hinted at in the way it blocked our view in visible light, is now glowing and showing us a whole new aspect of this galaxy. Well, we can keep readjusting. Different wavelengths bring out different color sets, different palettes, and tell us different things. Here, stretching further into the infrared, star formation, star formation regions start bursting out. We expand our view now to span all the way from x-rays in purple to blue for the ultraviolet, visible light in yellow, uh, infrared in red, and we see this sort of multi-spectral view of the, the gas clouds, the dust clouds, the hot stars, the cold stars, and the light from the neutron stars and black holes left over after uh, their lives ended in this one galaxy. Well, part of my job also has to do with what you might call editorial work. Uh, here we have a picture of the Orion Nebula, one of the favorite uh, objects in the sky, uh, one of the few star forming regions visible with the naked eye. But you might notice there are some blemishes in this, uh, diffraction spikes around the bright area, persistence artifacts caused by scanning over a bright object and having the detector not quite relaxed by the time it's trying to make other pictures. And so one of the things I have to do as part of my job is go in and identify all of the artifacts, the instrumental errors that aren't really representing what's out there in the universe, and use the same kind of editorial techniques to remove them from the picture. We don't want to put images out there that have something that looks like it's telling you there's a weird color thing going on when we know it's a, just an instrumental artifact, right? That's the kind of thing we remove. Now, the Orion Nebula, like so many uh, other objects in the sky, I feel like there's an entire gallery of images on anything you look at in the sky because every combination of light tells you something different. Here I've moved from an uh, uh, infrared view from the WISE mission, very wide field area, to a Spitzer picture that's a little tighter in. We had to pick and choose what we mapped with Spitzer. And now you see the same color palette, more or less, but now at higher resolution, you can start to see more of the features, stars forming in the dark spine down towards one side. But we can keep playing this game. We can keep 
pushing further into the infrared, combining uh, some data from Herschel. And now dust becomes, a, the, the colors become a temperature map of the, just the dust through this object. Or we can push it the other way and combine it with data from the Hubble Space Telescope and the visible spectrum. Now the blues and greens represent the hot gas, whereas the reds represent the cooler dust. We can keep switching the palette around, and even as we restrict it, perhaps even going down to just a, a couple channels, we are still seeing different aspects of this object that can be still very compelling. In fact, if uh, you look at it the right way, maybe uh, take it, you flop it, you rotate it a little bit and crop it, you might even find it makes a great backdrop for an alien starship in uh, Thor, the Dark World, which is always a treat when we see it make it jump into the popular media. Uh, switching to the, uh, the, the ends of stars, we have planetary nebula, the, the puffed outer layers of sun-like stars when they reach the end of their life. Now, sometimes the best story doesn't pop up with the first combination of uh, channels you do. This is a really lovely picture of this, this cloud of gas thrown out by a dying star. But if we include a longer wavelength of light, we actually can see maybe something a little more engaging. The uh, so-called Eye of Sauron tells us a story of dust clouds left behind in the system after the star died that hints at the material that comets and asteroids may form in, uh, even after the death of the star. Uh, add in a little ultraviolet light on the other side, and it gives you yet another view onto the same region, uh, telling some of the story, but maybe expanded. We can look at um, just the ultraviolet alone, and even with two channels of, of uh, data, if we just map it into two complementary colors, we can basically get a full color image that goes to white as things add together. And whether it be just a pretty nebula, the ghost of Jupiter a nebula around a nearby star, or whether we look at our nearby galaxy partner, the Andromeda galaxy, the closest spiral galaxy to our own, a couple million light years away. Uh, personally, my favorite view of the Andromeda galaxy is just this one simple two-channel ultraviolet view in which the blues are representing the light from the hottest, hottest stars in this galaxy. Uh, and it just, I think, gives a lovely view of uh, the, the spiral structures in there. Now, if we drag our slider a little down and make room for the ultraviolet or to the, uh, the X-ray part of the spectrum, we switch to some uh, work from the new star mission that I've uh, had a chance to work on. Now, sometimes you're lucky, and the, uh, the uh, X-ray data just tells its own story for you. I mean, when you have a dramatic ghostly hand reaching out in the cosmos for some red cloud, right? This is actually a nebula left around a pulsar, a, the, the core that was left behind after a supernova explosion that uh, still is emitting very high energy radiation affecting its surrounding material. Uh, why it's been sculpted in the hand of an outreached uh, scratch in the form of outreach hand is part of the mystery of what was the environment before the explosion? How much of this is related material cast out by the star? Questions astronomers are still answering. Uh, we can look at the remnant of uh, material after a supernova, the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And here, purely looking in the X-ray, we have this really, really colorful region. But here, each color is actually mapping us onto the ejecta of a particular elemental species, uh, uh, iron and, and titanium and, and other things. So by looking at just the different wavelengths of light, it tells us a story of how the different layers of the star got torn out and spit out asymmetrically into space and are, are sort of recycling these heavy materials back into the universe. Now, sometimes you're not as lucky. The X-ray data might not initially tell a story that you can really get your uh, teeth into. Uh, if I were to ask you to identify what this is a picture of, I'm not sure any of you would immediately say, oh, clearly it's the sun, you know, the first full image of the sun in hard X-rays. So we go and we find some other wavelengths to play with, like uh, go to another X-ray telescope and pull in slightly lower energy X-rays. Well, now we start to see a little bit of the limb, but it doesn't look much like the sun. Maybe if we go down into the ultraviolet and pull some stuff up, uh, we can pull in more and uh, maybe uh, finally round it out with one more wavelength. We finally get to a fairly compelling, I hope, image of the sun as seen in just the highest energy emissions. But the focus still comes back down to those x-rays, those bright blue-white spots, the story we were trying to tell. So if you like looking at imagery like this, I might put a plug in for our AstroPix website. Uh, it is a place where we aggregate thousands of images from all the uh, major research observatories in space and on the Earth, uh, uh, approaching 7,000 images. And what's great about our site is we actually have a lot of metadata in these images that tell you things like the, the name, the caption, how it's oriented to the sky. We have a similar little color widget down at the bottom that helps you interpret what you see in the image and what part of the spectrum it comes from. And you're also one click away from viewing these things in context in the sky and see how, how they lay and how they compare to other wavelengths of light. 
And with that, I conclude your very quick tour through the hidden universe.